I wanted to show that I'm good at stuff too. Mm -hmm. And so I worked so hard at everything I did. I wanted to be the best at everything I did. And honestly, I don't think that was my natural personality. I was kind of more like a relaxed, you know, just kind of draw pictures and not really be a driver. Mm -hmm. But I feel like he put a fire under me. You are listening to the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. Now, in today's episode, we talk to the guy who runs the show, the puppet master, the Wizard of Oz himself, Doug Eggie, the producer of Mind Pump. We actually interview him and talk all about uh, how everything started. And then we talk about Mind Pump and how that started and how we grew and the moments we knew that this would be something we'd be doing for a very, very long time. If you're interested in podcasting or fitness or building a business, or you just want to hear some really, really good stories, you're going to love this episode. Now, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Zbiotics. Now, Zbiotics makes uh, genetically modified probiotic drinks that help take away the negative effects of alcohol consumption. Now, these probiotics don't exist anywhere. They're genetically modified and patented, so you can't find them anywhere except for in Zbiotics. And what these bacteria do when you consume them before you drink is they produce an enzyme that breaks down some of the negative byproducts of alcohol. So in my personal experience, I've taken this before I went out drinking, and I wake up the next day feeling like I didn't even drink. It's really remarkable stuff. It's for reals. This is science, ladies and gentlemen. Try it out for yourself. The stuff is legit. And because you listen to Mind Pump, you actually get 10% off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to zbiotics.com. That's Z-B-I-O-T-I-C-S dot com forward slash Mind Pump. And then use the code Mind Pump for 10% off. Also, uh, right now, what we're doing is we're putting our most popular at-home workout programs on massive discount. Looks like gyms are closing down again in some parts of the country. And a lot of you are still not confident going back to the gym. But you want to get great results. You want to build muscle. You want to burn body fat. You want to look amazing and feel amazing but you're working out at home and you have limited to no equipment. Don't worry. We have the best programs you'll find anywhere uh, along those lines. Now, the first program is MAPS Anywhere. All you need are resistance bands and a broomstick and your body. That's it. Great muscle builder, great fat-burning program. We also have MAPS Suspension. This is a suspension-based program. So suspension trainers are the things you hook over the top of your door. They have handles. You could do all kinds of different exercises. You could do very advanced and difficult exercises, or you could do ones that are more suitable for beginners. So we designed a whole program based solely on suspension trainers for your entire body. We also have a program called MAPS HIT. Now, HIT is high-intensity interval training. This is a fat burner, ladies and gentlemen. This is to burn calories. You're looking at 15 to 25-minute short, intense workouts that burn the maximum amount of calories. Now, all three programs combined normally retail at $291, but right now you can get all three for $99.99. That's it. One-time payment. You get access to all of them. If you follow all of them from beginning to end, you're looking at a good four to six months of exercise programming. So you got a nice workout system and program right in front of you for only $99.99, and they also come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you could sign up, try them out, and if they don't Blow your mind, return them for a full refund. Here is how you sign up, or if you just want to learn more, go to mapsnovember.com. That's the word maps, M-A-P-S, november.com. Probably the most requested podcast episode. I would say up there up there with the, the girls. Yeah, right? I was going to say, that's the other one where everybody wants to hear the girls' perspective. Yeah, too, which we're but, not going to put that. Uh, yeah, let's wait on that. Yeah, they know not, too much. Yeah, yeah at least not yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, but not, this, not happening. But the second most popular is that we interview Doug. Yeah. Yes, the voice behind it all. The yeah. guy who runs the show, who manages the, what, herds the cats. Yeah. The cat herder. The cat herder. Yeah. Runs the business. The, the Wizard yeah. of Oz. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. So... <laughs> So, Doug, uh, let's go all the way back. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, let's go all the way back. First, I want to say you're, I've known you the longest, and you are definitely one of the best people um, I've ever met. That's a true story. Definitely one of the best people. And so I, I want to know how that all started. And when I say best, I mean you've got incredible integrity, morals. You're a good person, just genuinely good person. 
And oftentimes that that comes from some of your upbringing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what was it like being a kid growing up in the 1700s? Yeah, where do the, uh, yeah. <laughs> where, where the where do the values and morals come? Yeah, from? for real. You do for for a guy who doesn't uh, you know tout any religion or say anything like that. You do seem to have uh, a, a very uh, moral Good moral fabric. Yeah. yeah, there. Well, I can thank my parents a hundred percent. My parents were, uh, I mean, very traditional when we grew up. They were. Married, I think, in 1951. So they grew up during that time where you know the the family values, the the mother, the father, family unit was extremely important. They were religious. Uh, we went to church typically three times a week. Okay. Oh, a lot and, of church. Yeah, a lot of church. Now, did you? Okay, so when you were going through that, because I have a similar story, did you uh, hate going when you were that? Yeah. Or I absolutely despised it. Okay. Honestly. Mm-hmm. Okay. I. And then part of the reason was, is I was a daydreamer and I was very into creative type things. And I went to church and the, I heard the, the messages there and it wasn't entertaining at all. And so I would just sit there and daydream the entire time. Mm. So that's a confession. So if anybody knows me, that's, uh, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're similar in that because I, I too had the, you know, three days a week in church since mm. I was seven years old. And on and felt the same way too. Many yeah. times I would be, I would trail. I had a hard time focusing. Yeah, uh, very much so for me. Did you have any issues like that in school too? Yes, absolutely. In fact, when I was in elementary school, I did very poorly the first few grades. Hmm. In math, I remember all the all my friends. They all knew their times tables, and I couldn't get past like the threes. And it was just because I didn't put any energy or focus into it. I couldn't pay attention in class. Well, those threes are motherfuckers. Yeah, too. man. So three <laughs> times seven. What was that? I, I couldn't figure it out. Did you do a lot of drawings? It's, like real tri- it's real tricky after one. Yeah, yeah I, I was a doodler. Actually, I did. I, I drew a lot of pictures in class. I constantly was focusing on other things, thinking about all the things I wanted to do uh, outside of class. So I wasn't focused at all on that. And then at one point... I was put into the lowest math class and all my friends were in the highest math class and I didn't like that. And so for me, that was putting a little bit of a fire under my butt and say, okay, you've got to concentrate. You've got to figure this out. And so I really got serious about my times tables. I was able to finally get them, you know, up to 12 times 12. And uh, I started to excel a little bit in math and then I got raised up to the next level class because I want to be with my friends, right? Now, is that when you started to discover like that hard work equals results? Was that the first time you kind of figured that out? Yes. I think that was one of the things that clicked for me. It's like, okay, if I put energy and effort into learning something, I can get good at it. Now, now was this a, a lesson in your family? Was your family very hardworking? Like, what were the values that they... Yeah, because you always talk about your brother and like how, you know, you've seen him be successful. And was he like an example for you? He was. He was a motivator for sure. Um, He had a very high standard for me because he had a very high standard for himself. And he was actually very talented in many ways. He was very good artistically, which was, for me, was my forte because I was always the best artist in my class. And I loved to draw pictures and I was very much into the creative things. Mm -hmm. But my brother was also very athletic, which I've never been super athletic. I mean, if I practice something... A lot. I can get fairly good at it, but my brother was just a natural athlete with great hand-eye coordination. And one of the things my dad did is he took a skiing when I was fairly young. And so we go up on the slopes, and my dad was not a good skier. In fact, my dad was not athletic really at all, but he enjoyed skiing. So he took us up on the slopes, and we go skiing. And my brother would really work at it, you know, to get really good. And he got to be a very, very good skier. And me, I was just like going down the hill, you know, kind of these wide, you know, swoops across the across the slopes. And and my brother, he goes, you're a horrible skier. You're absolutely a horrible skier. You got to be doing this. You got to be doing that. And he just like ride me, and it's like I don't want to be horrible. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't want to be horrible. So I would really work at getting good at something, and I ended up being a actually a pretty good skier, probably better than average. What's the age difference between you and your brother? Six years. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So he was very much a, a motivator in that respect. I think naturally I take more after my, my dad. Uh, my dad was, he was very interested in audio production, things like that. He had, a, you know, we had movie cameras from the time I was a small 
child. My grandfather actually had movie cameras, so like he the got Super that. Super Eight ones and all that. Oh yeah, yeah. so uh, we have uh, we have movies of my mom over at my dad's house when she was like seventeen years old, and that wasn't very common back then. Yeah, that was back. Boy, that was in the nineteen fifty or nineteen forty nine. We have movies, family movies from back then. Wow. So it's, it's I've I have family movies of my parents' wedding. So I I got that part from my dad, right? My dad's just not athletic, uh, and my dad was never a driver for perfection, but my brother was. My dad was a hard worker, very hard worker. I mean, he was a, a middle school principal. He always uh, provided well for the family. They, of course, they grew up with parents from the depression, so they were very cautious with their money. Um, my mother incredible lady i mean she's 88 now uh i love her as so much she is just a super good-hearted person um everybody loves her and uh so i mean i i really feel i got you know so many great values from my parents and i i really appreciate that and even though i don't go to church i feel like what i got from them as far as my moral code and and how i treat others and so on is uh, a reflection of how great of parents that they mm. were. Now, Doug, I remember you telling me when years ago when I trained you that you were a chubby kid. Mm-hmm. You, you had issues with weight or whatever, and that's kind of how you started to discover fitness? Yes. So, again, my brother plays into this as well <laughs> in many ways. My brother, when he was like seven, eight years old, he was, I would say, obese. So he would eat uh, eat a lot of food, and uh, you know he's a very active kid. I think he was at the time, but he would just overconsume calories, and he really struggled with his weight up until the time he was, I believe, fifteen or so. And so when he was fifteen, he got very interested in girls, and he was in high school, and uh, so one summer he was like I think sixty pounds overweight. Wow. Okay, at that stage, one summer. I don't know how he did this, but he just spent the entire summer just really eating very low calorie. And by the end of the summer, he had lost a good portion of that weight, if not most of it. So when he went back to school, nobody recognized him, really, because wow. he had lost so much weight. And my brother, just one more thing. Not only was he a good athlete, not only was he a good artist, not only was he very good at a lot of things that he tried, he was also very good looking. And, you know, so I always had these, the standard, always trying to, to equal this guy. And so when he started to get fit and healthy, I started to get a little bit more interested in, in that myself. Now we're, we're, we're talking to the, the old wise mature Doug that's probably grown through a lot since then. When back then, was there resentment or animosity or competitiveness with him because of that, you know, being the smaller, younger less attractive, less talented, less athletic brother. Did you resent him at all for that? Did you go through a phase of that? <laughs> I sound pretty pathetic, don't I? <laughs> of course I resented that. <laughs> How can anybody well, be more attractive? Because than I mean you're you you you're you you speak so highly of him and I know you guys have a very good relationship, but I have to <laughs> think that, you know, if you you know as a as a young immature kid who's not probably very self-aware uh, at that age, you probably or bitter or angry a little bit about it. And, you know, did you start that way first? And if you did, what was that like? And where was the transition into a, a different outlook on it? Yeah, there there was a certain degree of jealousy regarding him, I believe, in, in some, some ways. Because um, I felt like I could never live up to that standard. And it's like, you know... If you're if you're around somebody that's very good at something and and you want to be good too and you know you're never going to be like them it's like well what's what's wrong with me am I a lesser mm. person or w- whatever the case may be so I, I would say I probably had some insecurities regarding that um, I mean it didn't help that he kind of fed the fire at times I remember when I was probably I think I don't know eight years old or so and he was like fourteen he brought home some boxing gloves. <laughs> he's six he, years older than you. Yeah, he's six years older than me. Like, come on. So we put on these gloves. And he goes, Let's, "You can't get a punch in. You can't get a punch in." And I'm getting hit in the face and, and knocked, knocked around, and it's like, you know, my confidence was shaken. <laughs> he's just holding your forehead. <laughs> so, so for years, so for years, I really wanted to prove myself. I wanted to make my brother proud in some ways. I wanted to 
I wanted to show that I'm good at stuff too. Mm-hmm. And so I worked so hard at everything I did. I wanted to be the best at everything I did. And honestly, I don't think that was my natural personality. I was mm-hmm. kind of more like a relaxed, you know, just kind of draw pictures and not really be a driver. Mm-hmm. But I feel like he put a fire under me yeah. that drove me. And uh, in, in some ways, it was me trying to overcome my insecurities. Right. And over the years, I started to get good at stuff. Not the same stuff that he was good at, but I started getting good at other things. And this is what kind of led me over the years to become good at what I do now. All these things have built that foundation for why I can do what I can do. And also it built that work ethic. Cause I don't think I had that work ethic without him driving me. Mm -hmm. Hmm. When did you start to really find and feel your own identity? The things that you were good at? When did you start to feel like you yeah, I'm definitely been a late late bloomer in my life in many respects. It's probably in, been in the last ten years. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow, wow. So that's when you really started to feel it. That's now, awesome. now was your trip over to Japan? Was that part of kind of discovering yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about that, Doug, because you came, you grew up in such a conservative kind of traditional uh, leave it to Beaver type, you know, house, for example, or household or family. Yeah, absolutely. But then. Yeah, I mean, I know you, and I know you traveled a lot. You went all over the place. You did all kinds of. You lived in Japan for a while. What, how did that happen? Yeah. So I went to school. I went and graduated from college. I got my degree in business. I concentrated in accounting. However, thank God, I yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it pays now. Yes, it does. However, I hated accounting. Yeah. I really didn't like it, and I. The only reason I did it was because, again, I wasn't really living my own life at the time. It was like, okay, I had very successful brother-in-laws. They both had their, they were both uh, MBAs and and my one brother-in-law was a CPA and they had built their own businesses. My brother by this time, you know, was starting to find his way in business. And I thought, well, if if I'm going to be successful, I need to go out and get a degree that's going to be very practical. And that's going to be being a CPA, I guess, is what I thought at the time. And so I I did that not doing what I really would have probably done had I followed my heart. You know, I probably have been more interested in architecture or something like Mm -hmm. that, something with design involved. So I ended up getting that this this degree and I didn't want to do that. So I get out of college. I'm unhappy with uh, the prospect of being an accountant and so I end up getting a sales job. My brother was doing sales at the time. And again, kind of following his path. And he was being very successful. So I got a job selling industrial cleaning supplies for businesses. And I would go door to door to businesses with this big suitcase. <laughs> and I would show them degreasers and do these demonstrations and things like that and sell these things. But I wasn't that good at it. Okay, but it was a good experience because I went out there and I had to Mm. cold call a lot and I just wasn't making a whole lot of money. So I did that for a while and I ended up doing a a number of different jobs after college that had nothing to do with my degree. And my last job before I went to Japan was selling Chevrolets. And I did that for one year. Salesman of the month one month, oh, okay. sold 19 yeah. cars. Oh, there you yeah. go. But I- I give you a good deal. Yeah, I did. I, <laughs> I worked it. So yeah, yeah. no, I wasn't the greatest for sure, but I, I worked hard at it. And by the end of that, I was just like, what am I doing with my life? I got to do something different. And how old are you right now? Uh, about 25. Okay. And at the time I was living in a nice house with two roommates they had, we had a swimming pool at the house and this is up in Seattle. So it wasn't used year round, but I remember like one afternoon I just came back and I was floating in the pool and I was, what am I doing with my life? And one of my roommates said, you know what? I have a friend that went to Japan and they had an incredible experience. You ought to try it out. And so it's so random. Wow. Yeah. yeah he's I said, sure. Floating in the pool. Hey, you should go to Japan. I know somebody oh, else. I know somebody else did it. Sounds so, interesting. <laughs> so that's what I did. As I went to Japan, I actually went on a exchange program. I'd already had my degree, but there was a local community college that had a campus in Kobe. And so I went to that campus. I just paid for a quarter. Love that beef. Because, very, very yeah, very good beef there. And I went there just to have fun. And I had fun. 
believe me, it was some of the best time of my life. And I decided I'm going to stay here. And that's how I ended up getting a job and working there for six and a half years. And you, you what did you do there? You, you taught English. Teaching. I taught English. To kids. Wow, to you kids. Were, you were there that long. I didn't uh, realize you were yeah. there that long. Did you mm-hmm. Now, did you enjoy teaching kids? I, could, I did. You're, you're a natural with children. You really mm-hmm. are. Here's the thing. By that point, I had suppressed my natural tendencies so much of who I was as artistic. I'd stopped drawing pictures. I'd stopped doing all the things that I enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. That when I started teaching kids, it was an opportunity to resurrect a lot of that. And so I started, you know, doing fun things with the kids, drawing pictures and playing games and making skits and things like that. And I started to reconnect with that childhood thing that uh, made me happy. So the funny thing is, when I was a kid, I was a class clown. I would talk at the wrong times. I'd say inappropriate things. But over time, because of all this pressure I'd put on myself, I started to push all that down. And of course, I'd get some negative feedback too from being a class clown. The teacher would like, uh, be quiet, you know, and then I'd hear from other people, children should be seen and not heard and mm. stuff like that. Mm. And I suppressed a lot of who I was. And so going back to Japan and working with kids and being around kids and their spirit, you know, the, the kids are just amazing with, uh, they'll just say anything. Their, their pictures, their artwork is fantastic because they have no constraints. They haven't been put in a little box yet. And I got reconnected with who I am or I was in that experience. Now, what was it now? How did you enjoy or, or did you enjoy Japanese culture? What was that? that I mean, it's such a different culture from yeah, America. How long did it take to adapt to And it? this was what? <laughs> was this the 80s when you went there? No, 90s. 90s? Okay, so 90s, very different from mm-hmm. living here. Uh, was there culture shock? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Uh, so when I went there, I had really no interest in Japanese culture. I had no interest in Japanese food. I wasn't in the sushi or anything like that. So I went to Japan. I remember being on it's the- It's so crazy to me. That you, I know. This is floating around in a, on a pool floaty and you know, Buddy says this, no, in, no, don't even like sushi. You don't have any interest in the culture, but yeah. you say, fuck it, I'm doing you this. You know, it's interesting. That's it's the more thing extreme that, than, yeah. That's one thing we all have in common. Yeah. All of us have something like that in our lives. Well, so. this was my thought. If I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to keep getting the same thing I've always mm-hmm. gotten. Right. Yeah. And I could see no path out of that at that time. So part of it is you, which this is something very common. I think all of us did this, right? Mm-hmm. You you removed yourself from your comfort zone intentionally. Intentionally. Yeah. I ripped myself out of there. Yeah, you wanted to grow. You know, during that time, there was a movie with Christian Slater called Pump Up the Volume. Uh, mm. uh, Have you seen that movie? Yeah, and Gleaming the Cube around the same time. Yeah, that yeah. was an incredible <laughs> movie because this, this kid, he was a bit of an introvert. Yeah. He goes to a new school in Arizona and he has no friends, but he has this pirate radio show and he's really edgy and he's at night and he, he deals with all these, you know, kids calling in and asking questions. And then the topic of suicide comes up and he addresses the topic of suicide. He goes, don't kill yourself. Do something crazy. Do something different. I mean, it's a, a great message. If somebody feels like, my life sucks. I have no place to go. Things have just been bad and they look to the future. It looks bad. Do something different. Do something crazy. Take yourself out of your comfort zone and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I decided to do when I went to Japan. As I said, I'm going to just rip myself out of my comfort zone. I'm going to go experience some, something new. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? Mm, right, right. Now, you're you're a good-looking guy, good-looking American guy. I got to imagine you were popular with some of the, the Japanese ladies over there. What was that? What, what was that? Were you dating anybody? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's just where, say that- This is where all the oat sewing happened. <laughs> this, is, yeah, this is what you call shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Sushi. You're so exotic there, right? So. But kind of going back to what you're talking about, when I got to Japan, you know- no interest in Japan really at the time, mm-hmm. but I heard you could make money and I was interested in money. Okay. So I'm on this bus and I'm driving down, we're driving down this countryside basically from the airport and there's all these rice fields and you go through these little towns and all the buildings are tiny and all the cars are tiny and all the roads are narrow because you're out in the countryside 
And it's, I felt like I was just in another world. You felt massive for the first time. Yes. That's actually, that's actually true. I finally felt like, man, I'm... This is excellent. <laughs> the meat Godzilla yeah. music comes in. Dun, 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 dun. You mentioned something that I want to, I want I actually want to talk about. And I actually don't think you and I have gone deep. So I don't know the answer to this at all. Um, you have a really good relationship with money. Um, that was quite the, uh, the the journey for me to get to where I'm at today. T share with me where that comes from. Where where does where does your responsibility and the way you treat money and work like where where did that all come? That's from? That's a great question because you don't you always live uh, well below your means. Below, yeah, your means below your means comfortably. Even. I never right. you're not someone that spends your money on stupid shit. But yet you also like me are very competitive with the money thing and wanting to grow the business, and so you're very so it's not like you don't care. You're very mm. interested in that, and you just alluded to right. it again that you were you're money driven. But yet, it doesn't rule your your world, and you have a great yeah, relationship. Where'd you get that? So, where does that all come from? Well, again, I can look to my parents as far as how to use money. My parents, again, very traditional. So, my mom never worked. My dad was a middle school principal, and we live very frugally, or they live very frugally. So, we got. You know, we got presents on our birthday. We got presents on at Christmas time, but we never got a lot of stuff in between. When it came time for me to go to college, they weren't going to pay anything. It was up to me to go make all the money for for school, and so I I worked during the summer to pay for my college, and so I had to be very careful with my money as well. And so I think some of their frugality rubbed off on me mm. right yeah, that's interesting though because sometimes you know and a kid like me who didn't have very much growing up too uh when you finally get it though you tend to kind of go the other direction and you didn't did you or did you and then you that was a lesson for you like well so if i look back so i, I lived in japan for six and a half years and during that time i had very few expenses other than me going off and traveling to different countries and things like that yeah you told me in the past you lived in like a little room and you rode a bike yes i lived in probably a hundred square foot room oh, wow. and then we shared i had i lived with some other teachers we shared a very small living room it had like a two burner gas burner hot plate in there, a tiny, a tiny wow. refrigerator. It's like a dorm room. Like one bathroom. It was very rustic, if you will. It was actually my boss had a home that had been there for probably a few hundred years. And the backyard had these buildings. So they, they were very wealthy rice farmers in the day. And these buildings in the back of their house had rice storage containers and things like that in them. And I lived in the back on this little unit that they had back there, so it was very, very rustic. Now, did you did did you become a, like a, a minimalist from it? Did you find like value and, and joy out of, of not having a lot of stuff? Was that something you enjoyed? In other words, I don't know if I ever found value and joy out of that. I was able to still c accumulate a lot of stuff while I was there. Mm. My my little room was packed full of things, so I don't think that was it. Uh, but I. I felt like, hey, we were all in the same boat. I didn't really need a lot of space. I rode a bicycle everywhere. I had, I didn't have to pay rent. Uh, we had a phone bill. That's about it. And then going out and eating and have having a good time every weekend. That's so. What did you? On. Were you stacking your chips? Were you starting to yes, save money? Quite I was saving. Oh. And so by the time I left Japan, I'd saved over a hundred thousand oh, dollars. I'd wow. invested in some stocks and things. I mean, at the time, unfortunately, I still don't have them. I had like Starbucks stock back then. Oh. Like, you know, I look back, man, I, oh. <laughs> who knows where I would be now, right? right. <laughs> so I was very careful with my money. And then when I got back to the U.S. from Japan, the first thing I did is I went and bought a triplex as an investment property. Mm. But... Then I had a turn of events. Mm. Well, before we get into that, why'd you leave Japan in the first place? It sounded like such an awesome... Mm -hmm. It was great. So the first four years in particular, I had a great time. And then I started taking on additional teaching gigs, like private one-on-one -on -one coaching for adults and things like that. And over time, I just working a lot, stopped having as much fun with it. So you just didn't get much out of it anymore? Yes. And of course, after, after time goes on, uh, you, you kind of get 
acclimated, right, to mm-hmm. a situation. So it wasn't quite as exciting as it was before. Got it. Okay, so and, you come back, you buy the property. Yes. So I, I, What happened? I basically said, okay, if I keep doing, again, I was in a similar situation where I was before I went to Japan. It was like, okay, if I keep doing this, this is what I'm going to end up doing the rest of my life. And I don't want to do that either. Because I was having a good time, but, you know, I, that, I didn't see that as my future. And so I said, I, I have to get back. Besides, my parents are getting older. I don't want to be away from them because, you know, I, I don't want to, to miss time with them. So this is still the 90s, though, right? This is the 90s. This is like 1998. Yeah, so $100,000 in your bank account is a lot of money at, at 30, what, tw- late 20s or early 30s now? Early 30s? 90- early 30s, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. early 30s and in yeah. the 90s. I mean, you're doing pretty well. I was doing pretty good. Yeah. And so you move back. We get in the States. And one of the first things you do is... Well, so... The, the, the thing is, is I come back and now I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> so what I ended up doing is running tours for Japanese people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes yeah, sense. So I bring people over. I take them around. We do homestays for kids, things like that. And I thought I was going to build this little business here. But it ended up being very challenging once I exhausted all the people I knew over there. Yeah. And besides, I decided I didn't want to do that either. And I got an email from somebody saying, hey, you can sell financial seminars online. And so I started doing that. (laughs) And I started making phone calls. So I was basically cold calling people on the phone for these financial seminars. And I was selling them. And you could make very good money if you sold these seminars. And as it turns out, these seminars were offshore. Okay. (laughs) And they talked about all types of things like, you know, U.S. income tax. The, I think it's the 13th Amendment was never ratified. Yeah, so the this, state's never ratified it. So we don't, right, technically, so, we don't have to pay income tax. Right, right, right. So there's, <laughs> there's a, some very <laughs> radical ideas being offered. Plus, their whole premise was you're not getting the information that the very wealthy are getting. Like where to invest your money. You're investing in all these things that are bringing you, you know, three, four, five percent. The rich are making like 10, 20, 30, 40 percent on their investments. They're not paying as much tax and, and that type of thing. So we had these big seminars that we were driving to offshore. Most of them were in Mexico, but I went to the Bahamas as well. And we go to these big events and it was a good time. And you meet all these investment advisors And so I started putting some of my money into some of these investments. And some of these investments were so incredible, just to show you how naive I was, that I ended up selling my triplex and taking my money and putting it in some of these investments. Now, was it it because you were making huge percentages back? Well- or you were sold that you were so sold that I was. And, oh, so okay, wait, wait, how, okay. How much? Let's back up a little bit here. Sounds like a Ponzi scheme. Well. Hundred grand in your bank account. What's the triplex cost you back then? How much did you have to put down? I think it was like three hundred eighty thousand dollars for the triplex. And you put down how much? Do you remember? <sighs> Boy, I, I don't recall. I, I think I ended up putting down like eighty grand. Okay, not, or less than that. Okay. I, I don't recall. So you put a big chunk of the hundred k down, though, is what you're saying. I did put quite a bit of that in. Okay, there. so mm-hmm. and that, and so and then you get into this whole investment thing. It lo- it sounds amazing. You get sold on this idea. You cash out the place. I'm I'm assuming you sell it for at least what you bought it for. Uh, yeah, I made a little extra money. Obviously, after you pay commissions and everything, yeah, right? It wasn't as good, but I did make some money. And you take your money now and you start investing in these yes. these financial opportunities. And the thing about this thing, this <laughs> this <laughs> organization. Guys, huh? and these events offshore was that there'd be like 2,000 people there and it seems so legitimate. Of course, there's all these people, right? You're yes, that every, a all lot these people of social proof. That's how they yeah. get those MLM guys get Damn. you too. Same Damn. thing. No, wow. exactly. A beach, and it was a, a bit beachfront of, property in Arizona for you. It was that. a bit of an MLM. Yeah. So I would sell these things and I'd make 1000 to $5,000 every time I sold something. Wow. Yeah. So I was making some pretty good money doing this. Uh, but come to find out, (laughs) (laughs) well, here comes the rub. So let me step back a bit. I did so well with this that I actually ended up on their leadership council of like 30 people. (laughs) Diamond plate. uh, Yes. So I was one of the top guys. And so one day we're on a call with the co-founders. There were three co-founders. The FBI. I love this story. (laughs) Hold on. Let me tell the story. It's my favorite story that he ever tells. So we're on this call and the the three co-founders, all of a sudden they disappear from the call. 
what's well, happening? And the one co-founder, he was based out of Washington. And I could hear his bird in the background, you know, some type of parrot or something. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't know what happened to it. Come to find out there was a, a massive raid, one of the biggest like IRS type raids in the country. And they took down not only these three guys, but a bunch of other people. Fortunately, I never did any crazy tax stuff, okay? But after that happened, every time I saw a black Suburban, (laughs) I was nervous, man. I was very nervous. Now, they audited the shit out of you, though, for a while, didn't they? They did. And it wasn't necessarily because of that, but they started to get into that, okay? Yeah, probably because you were just associated. Associated. So... we ended up getting out of that organization. Now, how of much then did you lose a ton of money? Well, I lost all my money. Oh, you lost all oh, of it. Oh, and then brutal. I started to, so I became much more conservative. God, that's on how a, I did that's things. a big deal. Right? What a lesson. Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, <laughs> oh, it t- it's a lot for anybody to save a uh, hundred K today. Saving is, is difficult for well, especially people. when you work so hard for it. Right, so I'm saying yeah. you live, you live below, well below your means in this tiny little apartment. You bust your ass for six years. You save all that money. You invest it wisely in the triplex. That was a smart thing. Yeah. Then you say, then you sell that and then you, you dump it all into this. That must've just like ripped your heart out. Oh man, I felt like I got kicked in the gut. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, mm. it's absolutely horrible. Now, what'd you do after that? Well, uh, I had started another business selling essentially entities like corporations, LLCs, and mm. things like that. So I had a business partner at the time, and we were doing pretty well with that. Actually, that's how I got into internet marketing. Got it. So this was back like nine. Uh, sorry, two. Can't get my years straight here. 2001, 2002. Okay. So we- So I, little, I, little Sal and little Adam are just starting as little personal trainers at 24 mm, Yes. <laughs> I started in 98 though. Yeah. But I had started mm-hmm. doing some type of internet marketing. So we started to drive people uh, to uh, landing pages and things like that and capturing leads. Oh, this is really er- this is yes. early. This is early in the, the internet mm-hmm. marketing world. Very early in that. And so I was starting to learn how to do all that stuff. And we're selling these entities. Uh, Again, we did that for a few years, and then we ended up selling that business. But for some reason, well, I'll tell you the reason. So my business partner wanted to do some day trading. And so we created this account with not a lot of money, like $15,000 for him to do some day trading. And he started doing tons of trades, tons of trades. This was, I think, about 2015. And what had happened is we never submitted the, the tax documents. Oh, my gosh. And so what the IRS saw was like $2 million worth of trades. Mm. Oh, but they had no idea what the basis was or how much money we lost or, or made was. We, in fact, had lost about $15,000. <laughs> so we had a loss, but that's what triggered the audit. Mm. And so once the audit started, now they started to pull in all our personal uh returns and also started asking questions about this organization that we were a part of. And, uh, I believe me, I sweat for a long time. That audit went on for an entire year. Yeah. You still haven't started. It makes sense now while you you are still, it's so such a stickler with like, yeah, you're so puckered. I know taxes and, you know, and finance and all that stuff because you got right. You learned that lesson for all of us. Yeah. You tasted that. Yes, I did. I tasted that. So I had kind of strayed from where my dad was being super conservative about money. And then I kind of got a little bit loose and, you know, like throwing darts at a board essentially mm-hmm. for making high returns and in investments. And I lost. And so I really learned a lot about obviously investing and being conservative in that respect, but also about taxes. I learned a lot about what to do and what not to do Mm. regarding taxes. And so not only do I have an accounting background, but I also have this experience of knowing what the IRS is like and what you, you can and cannot do and, you know, where you can push things, but maybe where you shouldn't push things. Definitely. Definitely. Now at this time, and I'm going to go forward a little bit just so that we can go back. Um, when I started training you, I started training you, and I think it was, I don't know, if you, and you would talk a lot about your daughter. Uh, for the listeners, Doug is uh, one of the best role models if you want to be a good father. Really a phenomenal father, extremely patient, uh, very, very involved. And he would talk about his daughter, and then one day, this adorable little African-American girl comes in, 
and obviously looks nothing like Doug, who's very Caucasian. And he's like, oh, this is my daughter, Brianna. And I'm like, huh? I don't know. Okay. Uh, and then I started asking questions. And the story you told me was very fascinating about how she became your daughter. Were you dating? Can you tell us a little bit about that? And at this time, are you dating her mom? I was dating her mom and come to find out she was pregnant. Mm. When you were dating her? When I was dating her. Oh, yeah. shit. So before you started dating her, she had gotten pregnant. Yes. And then you said, okay. Yes. Mm. Oh, wow. So, of course, my initial response was, I got to get out of here. Yeah. But for some reason, I ended up sticking around. And uh, the baby was born. And not only was the baby born, Brianna was born, she was born with a diaphragmatic hernia, which, you know, is like a hole in the... Um, in the diaphragm. Mm. And so the, all the organs were floating up into her chest and her left lung was way underdeveloped and she had to go right into surgery right after being born. Oh, wow. And so I, I was there and I, I went through that and uh, I mean, I started to form a bond and attachment to this little girl and um, I just ended up becoming her dad Okay, wait, I want to go back a little bit <laughs> to the uncomfortable probably conversation here. So yes. you're you're dating her mom. Uh, you're at month one, two, or three. I mean, is it like you, you look at her and you're like, man, you're putting on a lot of weight. We should. I mean, <laughs> no, actually. Like, that... like, how did this conversation come up? Like, <laughs> no, I, I remember this day very clearly. She comes and I'm sitting on the bed and she says... I have something to tell you. And she was obviously very nervous and to you tell guys are, me something. Yeah, but how it far? It wasn't the burrito. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how far in are you right now? Like you're a month in, six months in, three. How long have you been dating her for? Uh, probably a couple months. Okay, okay. So this is really new. This is very new. Yeah. And she sits down and she says, again, it took a while to get this out of her, right? Right. She goes, I'm pregnant. And I'm going, you're pregnant. You're like shit. It's like whoa. That's exactly my thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My thought, and it's like, okay, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Right. Okay. Well, you know, you know. So I was have to suck it up and deal with it. So I kind of made that decision right there. But uh, so okay. Wait. Now at this moment, though, you think it's probably yours? Yes. Oh, so you oh. didn't know it wasn't even yours? Okay. So when does it when does it come clear that was it when she came out and she was black? When yes. Holy oh, shit! Man, none of this. That's a whole other part of the story. Yes. I've never, you've never shared that part of the story. Yeah, oh, man. Wow. Now you get, yeah, you get the wow. behind the scenes. Yes. Oh my god. Yes. Holy shit! So up into that point, you just assume that you got her pregnant, and of course you're sticking around. You're a good man. Yeah. And then, and then at this point, you've already trucked nine months plus with this this woman, or mm -hmm. almost a year with this woman, and not it, not almost a year, but and then out less, out yeah. pops a baby that you are certain is not yours. I'm. Well, it was hard to tell, though, because she was, because of breathing issues and everything, she was very purple. Oh, so you didn't know yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. you need to get me to the place where yeah, you, how'd you, start find to, out? you start piecing this together. Well, I mean, I, of course, I pieced together very quickly yeah, after sure. I got a good look. Because, you know, because as soon as she was born, because she- They rushed her off, right? Rushed her off. Yeah. Gone. Yeah, yeah. Gone. Yeah. Mm, wow. Mm, so when you figured, when you found out, like, what was that like when you figured, oh, this is not my kid? Did you think I'm out or did you think uh, obviously angry? I mean, I had to have stirred up all kinds of shit. Yeah, it did stir up a lot. Uh, I think I've suppressed some of these thoughts I had. But I think so too, because we've never talked about this. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, yeah, it was definitely an issue. And there's definitely parts of me that just wanted to, to leave. Yeah. For sure. Totally normal. Right. Yeah. I think most, I, you know, a if I lesser looked, man, a lesser man would have. Well, well I, this makes, and, I don't know what that means. And, and, and as difficult as this is to talk about right now, as, as I can imagine, uh, I mean, it just, again, speaks volumes of the man that you are. Even it, more reason now to leave. Right? Yes, I of course. I, I can't admit, I can't, I, I, I can't imagine I would stay. I don't know mm. if I could. Well, I don't know. I, I didn't think I would be able to do it either. Mm. And so does that make me a better man? I don't necessarily say it does. Mm. Was I just being stupid? Stupid or what? You know, I, I uh, that went through my head. Is, oh, I see. Is, is, is this really a smart thing to do? And honestly, looking back on it, I don't really know why I stayed. But but if I look in hindsight, I don't regret it. Of course. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because Brianna, she uh, has added something to my life that I may have never had. Right. Mm -hmm. For the longest time, I thought, I'll never have kids. 
You know, I, I like doing my own thing. I like my freedom. I like to be able to travel. Yeah. Back at the time, I was going out of the country at least once a year. I loved traveling. And a, a kid definitely didn't fix, fit into that picture. But because it was kind of almost thrust upon me and I ended up in this situation, I've been able to experience something that I may have never experienced. And it's enriched my life, my life in ways that I can't even describe. I started, to, obviously, as fathers, you all know, you start to feel love yeah. that mm -hmm. transcends any love you've ever felt before. I mean, right. before I thought, oh, I love my parents more than anybody in the world. And then this little girl just stole my heart. And I, the love was so intense. Sometimes it hurt. Right. And it kept growing and growing and growing. I don't know. So Do, how how long? Yeah, you make me cry, Doug. Yeah. So Jesus how Christ. long? <laughs> I, I, I didn't know this Lord this, this, this yeah. story at all. Oh, yeah, that's crazy. at all. So, Shows okay. you how much these guys really talk to me. Yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> well, I knew. <laughs> I knew <laughs> hey, <laughs> shut the fuck up! Yeah. I asked a very direct yeah. question. Asked, you could tell yeah. you did not want to go there. So. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, you've avoided that that You're, much detail yes, for yeah, sure. Yeah, lots of that. You're yeah. absolutely right, Adam. Yes, you. Yeah, but I got you. Part of me feels like, well, what. What kind of a sucker was I? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well I, mean, I mean, now look. I, mean, not, I don't regret it now, of course not. But yeah. at the time, it's like, what was even going through my brain? Well, and now, and obviously, how, it was meant to be. Don't yeah, absolutely. Something, it was meant to be. I, yeah. I don't regret it at and, all. And 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 you uh, and you and you stuck it out with her for how long before it finally? Because you guys didn't break that much that long ago. It wasn't that much before Mind Pump when you guys were broken up, right? So. Yeah, uh, I think things were really officially over with her mom in 20, 2012, actually. Okay, and that yeah. is how old is how is Brie was like eight. Oh, so mm. you stuck around, but her. but things had kind of gone south quite a bit in prior years. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you and you are very much her father, very involved, very much the man in mm -hmm. her life. Oh yeah. Stay. Oh, beyond that, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I think there's speculation on our part that you know when she gets to an age where if she has a decision to live full time with her mom or you, I think she'd live with you. Oh yeah. Well, I, mean, I don't know if that's entirely true. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, that's know. debatable. Yeah, you do a great job. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I did not know that, and I didn't know that you. So you stuck around for almost eight years trying to make it work, obviously, before it was obviously. Uh, yes, but I would say after year four, things had kind of degraded. Mm -hmm. A okay. fair amount. So yeah. let's 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 take a turn to now the 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 fun talk, which is us. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. So so <laughs> let, let, let's talk about let's start with fitness. When did you, when did because you had a passion for fitness way before you ever met me. I mm -hmm. mean, I, when I met you as when you hired me as your trainer, um, you were far more educated on fitness mm -hmm. than the average client. You knew a lot. Mm -hmm. When did that start? When did you when did you fall in love with fitness? Well, as I mentioned before, my brother was into fitness when he got into high school he got into football and things like that so he started lifting weights and i started getting a little bit interested at that time and then i think it was around nine you know, let me think 1982 or so or 1981 i can't remember when the rocky four came out with with the Russian or the one where he fights uh, Mr. T? No, with the Russian. It was a Russian. Yeah, yeah that's four. like eighty four, I think. Oh, was that eighty four? Yeah. <laughs> that's how Sal tells. I maybe it was. <laughs> wait, the, okay. Maybe it was Rocky wait. three. Actually, that was July of uh, two thousand and one. You told me it was Rocky three before. <laughs> okay, that's it was why. Rocky three. Yeah, so that's when he's fighting Apollo. So that's three. right. It was Rocky three. I, or I, with I, Apollo. Yeah. So I saw St Sylvester Stallone. I said. Man, I would love to look like that because I thought that was like the ideal physique at the time. And at that time, my dad was also kind of getting into fitness. He bought a membership at a local club, a lifetime membership. And I started working out with my buddy. And I would, I ordered up a bunch of muscle and fitness magazines. I was going to do this, you know, when I... So that's my personality. For sure. If I'm into something, You're into I'm it. fully into that's it. 100%. So I got all the muscle fitness magazines. I, In fact, I ordered a lot of the supplements off the back covers thinking this would be the thing that would actually mm. take me to the next level. Yeah, you did the Body for Life challenge with all the supplements. Yeah, the all deal, that right? stuff. Yeah. But of course, none of that stuff worked. Mm. And I'd go work out and, you know, like anybody just getting started, I was pretty young at the time. I put on some muscle when I first got going, but I just plateaued. And I would go to the gym all the time and I would just not grow. And I was so frustrated. I'd see these other guys in, in the gym and they were bigger. And I go, well, what's going on? What's, what's with them? 
and I thought it was myself. You know, I just thought, oh, I didn't have the genetics for it. Mm. Now you're you're still you're working out, you're staying active because you never really stopped, right? And then what got you to? Because I know you were referred to me by a chiropractor, mm -hmm. and that's how we met. What got you to to that point? Because that's years later, right? Yeah. So I'd worked out on and off over the years from the time I was about 17 years old up until the time I met you, I'd been working on, on and off at the gym. So even when I went to Japan, I, I wanted a gym and I found a local kind of a community gym oh, cool. and I went there, but well, I wasn't consistent, but I, I did like to work out. And a lot of my workout was designed number one to build muscle, but I, I worked out to try to burn calories. Mm. So I was not only working out, one of the things I consistently did over my life was cardio, running. I ran and I ran and I ran. Mm. And until later years, I got into tennis and I started playing tennis. So was, the idea was I was going to burn calories so I could go out and have a good time and eat. But it never seemed to balance out, you know. I was always like 15 to 20 pounds overweight all, all that time. And even in, I think it was 2001, when I was doing the sales for the the offshore seminars. Yeah. Yeah. Financial opportunities. I did the Body for Life Challenge. And uh, okay. again, like anything I do, I got the book, I got the journal, I followed all the, the meal plans. I bought the Myoplex, I think it was called. Yeah, yeah. I took all the shakes. I did everything yeah. for three months. And I saw some benefit from that for sure. But uh, yeah, so fast forward though, by the time I had some back issues, that drove me to the chiropractor. I don't think I was really working out a lot at that time, mm. but I had a, a bad back. I went to a chiropractor. He said, you know, Got I me. can help you, but you've got some muscle imbalances. And I know this trainer, you should talk to this trainer. His name is Sal. I know this guy. And he can really help you. He wears purple, tiny little underwear. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to love him. I don't do that anymore. Check out his lat spread. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So I went, I went to, ABS Fitness. Yeah. yeah. And I met this guy. His hair was perfectly combed. <laughs> he had a gray ABS Fitness shirt on. And <laughs> I remember he was wearing Adidas sweats. And now, were you enamored? Had a clipboard. Were you enamored right away or did, it, did he grow on you? Yeah. Well, I thought this guy is very professional. Okay. He was obviously muscular. So he looked the part. So very I'm, Rocky, I, very Rocky esque. Yeah, yeah, that's the, the Italian connection. stallion. <laughs> yes, yes. Connection. Definitely, Vibe definitely. Going on. Yeah. <laughs> No, because I'm this type of person. If I'm going to hire somebody to do something, I want them to look the part. Mm, I, yeah. I wanted them. So he, if he's a, a fitness guy and he's going to teach me how to build muscle and that type of thing, I want him to have some muscle. Right. So I saw him and go, this guy, yeah, he's very credible, very professional with his clipboard. And he talked about, did an assessment on me. I was drawing pictures. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't taking this. <laughs> Whatever the case may be. And then, of course, guess what came out at the end? It's like, okay, we can do... 10 sessions or you can do close your ass. close close me now okay, okay now you have a sales background yes yes so do you smell it a mile away or are you already roped in did he rope well, and dope? Was, did he, not a, I'm did not he a rope, bullshitter. Did he rope and dope you good or did, or did you <laughs> I see? delivered. Well, he, he, that's exactly right. He provided value for me. Okay. And so I in my mind I said I I should do some work with this guy. Okay. And of course, one of my questions is, is I, of course, I want to correct. So he wasn't a great closer. You just. You were already, you were already, you were <laughs> no, he's already probably a very good closer because he built the value. And it was just a matter at that point of okay. how much do you want to start with? How Got many it. sessions? 10 sessions, 20 sessions, 40 sessions. Mm -hmm. He had some breakdown, you know, discounts yeah. uh, as you go up. Yeah. But by that time, I was kind of sold on working with him. And of course, one of my questions was, was I, d I didn't want to just correct my back issue. I wanted to build some muscle. If yeah. I'm going to do this, I'm going to, I want to build some muscle. Yeah. And so I think he, I said, I'll, I'll start with a 10 session package. And so I bought the 10 session package, got going with the training. And after that point, I said, okay, I'm going to continue this. So I bought your 40 session package and I ended up buying that two or three or four times. I don't remember how many times I bought a 40 session package from mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And then I said to myself, well, I need to start earning some of this money back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, one thing I remember specifically was a conversation I had with you early on, Doug, uh, where I had to convince you that you did not need to train uh, lift weights more than twice a week. Do you remember that? Where you thought? Okay. Yes. I remember you saying, okay, you can work out twice a week. And I'm thinking to myself, 
is he, is that right? Is this really? Because I, I thought you had to work out, you know, five, six days a week. But probably knowing you, you're also intrigued because you're like, it's different, right? Of you, course. You tried a lot of things on your own and this is counter to what you've heard. Absolutely. Yeah. And I felt like I needed to trust him. Yeah. And so I did. He's got a trustworthy face. Well, one of the things when I first met him, the way he was talking, I've told Sal this before, he reminded me a little bit of Tony Robbins. Oh, just a little bit. Because I had done some, you know, some seminars with Tony Robbins. The big awkward face. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing. yeah, yeah. That, that thing. All the, old, the teeth. The, the beak nose. Oh. The <laughs> 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 beak nose. Wow. But anyway, so I, I ended up signing up for the extra. So you sign up with him. You get yeah. the training. He's an amazing trainer. We know that. And well, you know, the funny about Doug is that he was convinced he was a hard gainer. Convinced. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I remember. And, and he built. And, and the funny thing is he's far from a hard gainer. The guy's yeah. built strength and muscle. Like, well, like you and I, right? Responded we had, we very had, well. We hadn't turned the dials correctly. I thought I was mm -hmm. such a hard gainer myself, mm -hmm. too. Right. Like, as many as many kids think the same thing. So. You're training with him. How long is it into your training? Because now we're getting closer to when Sal and I get connected and when Mind Pump starts to connect. How long have you been training when you finally tell him, hey, man, why don't you think about getting this online? Because at that point, I'm pretty sure Sal, like me, doesn't know how to turn his computer on. Yeah. So you, how do, how do you, where does that, how do you guys get there? I'm trying to recall how long it took. It was a few months. Mm -hmm. I didn't say anything about it, but from the time I'd met him, it's like, because I was very interested in internet marketing and I was trying to do some of my own things at the time, but it really wasn't working out because, uh, you know, it does help to be an authority uh, on, on a certain subject in order to be successful with that. And I had in the back of my mind is that this guy's good. He has a good presence about him. He's very knowledgeable. I think he could be a good front man if we were to put something together. So I, I waited for a few months to pass. I wanted to let our relationship kind of developed. Oh, I didn't know you thought about this way before. Oh, yeah. Oh, so you were planning it. I yeah. was calculating. The minute, the minute you sold him yeah. his pack, your so package, used, used this talent. Used yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously, though. And uh, at one point, I started to just drop the idea to you. It's yeah. like, you know, if you ever... God, he's good. You know who the real yeah. closer he is? He is so good. Exactly. The, the real closer, right? N Ninja Doug over I'll here. be honest, I was a little nervous that you wouldn't want to do it. Because mm. one of the things I think a lot of people think is, well... I can do it myself. Why would I want to pay anybody? Oh, I, I was, I you was were smart, smart enough to know I, didn't know I, didn't, I couldn't do shit by myself. Right. Like that. Yeah. And you were yeah. smart enough to probably feed his ego a little bit first. Tell him how attractive he was, how right. smart he was. All how that. Tony all that stuff. Yeah. 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 That's, that's how you I, get that, things like that. And he'd said, yeah, I've thought about doing like an ebook or something like that. And then that was it. That's well, all I it said, took. And then no, guys... no ebooks. We got to get you on video. Hmm. Because this is where things are, right? We need we need to have video. And so then you guys then you guys create the muscle switch. Well, actually, a, before that, he says this, and I I had nothing. I thought, okay, I thought about writing a book or something like that at one point. He said, no, no we got to get you. I had no program. I had nothing. Right, right. And I, maybe a, it was like a week, and I remember it was just stuck in my head. And I'd always wanted to do something, and I liked Doug. Obviously, he's a good guy. He's very trustworthy. And I knew that I needed somebody to help me uh, in that space because I had no idea what I was doing with that stuff. And so I went home and for a week, it just was in my head. And we talked about it a couple of times and he says, if you ever come up with something, let me know. It's literally what he told me. Mm -hmm. You come up with something, he goes, just let me know. And one night uh, I was up late and I'm reading the New England Journal of Medicine and I read the study and I get this idea and I create MAPS Anabolic. And I brought it to Doug and I said, uh, let's test this out. Let's test out the trigger session concept. Let's test out this workout. Uh, I kind of train you like this anyway, but we're going to add these new elements and let's see what it looks like. And, and then we tested it on, I had a client gym that tested it. I had some female trainer friends that tested it and the results came back. People loved it. And then Doug's like, I'll do the internet part. I'll create the whole thing. You just got to get on camera and talk. Okay, I was so like, I can talk. So now you guys shoot this. You guys even did a couple of your first little sales funnels that had some success, and you're getting mm -hmm. you're getting a little bit of traction. At what point does Sal mention me to you? When when did I come up in conversation? I was like, you think I'm handsome? Wait, wait you mean this guy Adam? <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's oh an even God. bigger sucker than I am. <laughs> this is a circle jerk. We'll get him here. to work for free. Yeah. He's gorgeous. So yeah, <laughs> actually, I remember Sal. We had been working on maps. I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'd even started shooting it yet. I remember you showing me your phone and this picture of this guy who on the stage posing. Mm -hmm. And he goes, yeah, 
I, I don't know how this conversation comes up, but I, I do remember seeing a- Adam's image. So I don't even remember the context at the, at this time, what that was. I think I remember. So I told you essentially. The program I, wasn't shot yet. Because, I don't think so. Because Sal mm-hmm. and I are talking back and forth. And at this time, he's going through um, his mother. His mother-in-law is, is, is dying of cancer. That's right. And he's doing a lot of reading on in marijuana. Mm-hmm. And we had already heard of- That's about, how we connected. Yeah, it was over marijuana. It wasn't even over really the MAPS part. Oh, interesting. I mean, that came in, both came in the conversation, but yeah. really what uh-huh. started the back and forth was the marijuana talk. I was deep in the cannabis clubs. And at the same time, I was also simultaneously building my Instagram and making my way back into fitness, right? That mm-hmm. was my vision. And then Sal had this, this thing that he had already created. And we were talking, we had been already for weeks- you know, bullshitting about marijuana. He would share a study that had just came mm-hmm. up and tell me mm-hmm. something. I'd tell him about this strain or what I'm growing or what I was doing. And we just started to connect and bond on on Facebook. And then he sends over one day, I believe it was the muscle switch. Was yeah. that the first one? Was uh, that the first? No, it was, uh, it might've been the infomercial, Doug. Yeah, we shot a, like a 30 minute infomercial. Yeah, it was the long one. That's what it was. It was so- the long one. I shot it, I'll never forget it. I, I, I He sent it over to me. And I, by this time, I of course, I'd already heard great things of Sal from other friends that we have to meet, we have to connect. And at this time, Justin and I are doing our thing. I'm, um, I'm funding this app that Justin's basically doing all the work and building. Justin's building this app while I'm working the cannabis club. So him and I have this communication. He knows nothing about Sal yet. And I'm talking to Sal and Sal sends this over to me. I'm upstairs in my living room. I fired up on my TV on the big screen and I watched the 30 minute and I was just, at that time, I'm I'm already deep in the weeds of uh, Instagram, and and uh, what I'm starting to piece together at this time, as I'm starting to grow my Instagram following, is the messaging around the most popular fitness people. So, the most famous inst- at that time when Instagram was first getting started, all the people that had millions of followers were many of them were young, good-looking, fit kids that were presenting a similar message that probably I presented when I was 22, 23. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and not to, to you know knock them or shame them or whatever, just that they, they hadn't evolved as trainers yet, yet they were making, I heard, millions of dollars you know, on e-commerce. And I was fascinated by it with that. And I saw a huge opportunity for a better, the right message that, mm-hmm. that, that somebody wasn't presenting because it wasn't as sexy. And, and you guys did such a good job packaging this less sexy message but the right message that people needed to hear and i called him right after that i remember i called him we got on the phone we talked forever and said we got to get together we've got to meet and and i'll share with you what i'm doing what i'm thinking you can share with me what you are and that was the first Mm. real meeting with with all of us and then i I mentioned that i said hey i want to bring my friend justin uh, who I'm working on an app with, I think he mm-hmm. could he could be a value to this conversation. Yeah, because the way I pr- I talked to Doug because Doug wasn't there for the first meeting. It was just uh, it was just us. And I remember the way I presented it to Doug is I said, "Look, I said, um, I know P- I, there are people that I know very well who know and speak very highly of Adam. We, we're both we have mutual <laughs> friends, uh, Larry Evans, for example, mutual friend, Jason and, Marcucci. And Mar- Jason Marcucci. These are these are great sales guys, great presenters." Great men, uh, too. Great guys, great guys. And they always spoke very highly of Adam. And then I had been talking to him a little bit. And that's why I sent you the the first the MAP sales video. Because I, won't, I, I thought, if anyone's going to give me a good opinion and good feedback, it's going to be you. And he did. And then we got on the phone. And so the way I presented it to Doug was I said, look, here's a deal. Uh, if we're going to sell this program, we need some authority. And one of the best ways to build authority in my opinion, and I said this early on, was I want to be known for the my words and the way I present information. I don't want to be known for the way I look because at some point that's going to be gone and it's not very valuable. I want to be on, I want to be able to talk and present myself, but how are people even going to want to listen to me? Who am I mm-hmm. on the internet? I'm a nobody. And sure, I can get ripped, but you put me on, uh, on Instagram and I, I disappear compared to everybody else. Well, here you are. You're a, a pro IFBB competitor. You had a little bit of a falling on Instagram. People already vouched for you. So I didn't really know all, you very well yet. Those are the things I knew. Mm-hmm. So I told Doug, I said, worst case scenario, we start a podcast or we work with these with this guy. He's going to bring an audience and at least give us some authority. We have an IFBB pro who's going to create some authority. I will create some authority. We had not talked about selling maps 
through any podcast or anything at that point. I just thought connecting with you. No, because our businesses us, were separate at this we're time. We're separate. Mm-hmm. I said this will be a great way to build some authority. Because yeah. if I can mm-hmm. talk if I can, you know, partner up with someone who's a pro, uh, just by association, I've got a little bit of authority. So that's the way I told Doug. And then when we sat down and met, and of course everything went out the window because we sat down and it just took off. We sat there and we talked for hours, and I remember call, I called you, Doug. I think on the way home, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "You got to meet these. You got to meet these guys." So you got to share, years. Doug, now um, your experience of learning about each of us. So you you've learned about <laughs> Sal now. Um, you're about to go into ma- you know this is a marriage, right? We're married to each other, all, the four of us, right? Very much so now. It's mm. a polygamous uh, relationship. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. four ways. Yeah. So it, you know you 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 like Sal already. You've created this thing. You're now you know considering getting into this marriage with you know myself and Justin. What is that experience for you? I mean, are you uh, are you cautious? Are you re- are you reluctant? Are you telling Sal behind closed doors? I don't know if I you know this Justin guy yeah. seems pretty shady. Pretty fat. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was I Justin. I said it was shady. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like ooh, another charismatic crazy guy. Yeah, <laughs> great. So yes. Very cautious. Mm. For one thing, we would built Maps Anabolic, and it was a very long process to film it, to create the web pages. I mean, I did all of Doug that. Doug did everything. I that. I went and did the WordPress site. Mm. I did the membership site. I, I shot all the film. I edited most of it. Right. You got a lot I of did, work. I put so much of my heart and soul. So this was a baby, right? right. A mm-hmm. baby. And I just wasn't going to go out and just give this baby to anybody else. So I was extremely cautious. Yeah. So when I met you guys, I, of course, was looking kind of sideways at you like, okay, who are these guys? You know, are these people that we really want to share the baby with? Yeah. But I also knew that we'd been trying to sell Maps Anabolic for up until that time, probably about a year. Mm. Oh, it would have been a good year. You about a year because we launched Maps Anabolic, I believe it was around October of 2013. We'd done it, some YouTube videos. Yes, we actually paid for some Facebook ads and mm. things like that. And we'd also had created the NoBS six-pack formula as our kind of our entry-level program to kind of lead into maps anabolic and we were having some success with it we were selling we we're selling some mm-hmm. okay but we weren't going to get rich anytime fast and one of the things is you know i felt we, we had a really good program right uh, i thought we had the better mousetrap and there's a saying like if you build a better mousetrap people will beat uh, a path to your door mm-hmm. well that's not true because if they don't know about your better mousetrap, nobody's coming, yep. right. right? So people need to know about it. Right. Just because you have something that's great doesn't mean that people are going to go out and buy it. Right. Yep. So I, so as as I was approached by Sal about this whole podcast concept and bringing you know you two into the fold on this, I was reluctant. But I also said to myself, well, if things are not going the way I want them to go right now. We may need to sh- shake things up a little bit. Now, do you remember this, Sal? Do you remember what, I mean, this is, I'm thinking of conversations that we're not around for. Are oh, you yeah. and Doug going like, well, let's just, we'll hang, we'll move slow with these guys and we're not well, sure. Well, yeah, if you recall, um, we didn't sell anything for a year on the podcast. Right, right. It was we, just the podcast. That's so, why it was okay, was nobody was, I mean, one of the beautiful things about this was. There wasn't anything on the line except our time. Yeah. And, if, at the, and again, this was, my thought was, worst case case scenario we gain some authority and some uh visibility people at least more people are going to see us and know us and i was confident enough both doug and i were very were confident enough that i would present myself well enough to where it would be a plus anyway obviously though when we did the podcast it was i mean after the first podcast we all felt it was something special i want to ask doug this because we were off the rails in the beginning, and we had a lot of fun. And you, <laughs> you were very cool with it. You were very cool. At any point, were you like, okay, this is a little too, too much, too crazy? Yes, I was a bit nervous at times. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I come from a very conservative family, very conservative, you know, parents and, and upbringing, and some of the conversation made me very uncomfortable, mm. very uncomfortable. However. I said to myself, I need to let these guys be who they are. They're obviously new to this game. They're nervous. They're using some alcohol yeah. to calm their nerves. <laughs> a little yes. bit. 
but they have great chemistry. That's what I saw from day one. I saw a very good chemistry between all of you, and it was fun conversation, and it was entertaining. And not only that, it was also valuable. So there was, I think, I think that was like a magic combination, right? You, if you have something of value to say, something good to say, and you say it well, and it's fun and entertaining, that's kind of like a magic uh, thing. That's kind of the X factor, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That can actually make something go viral, right? If mm-hmm. you will. Now that that's just that's a, a aspect of this business, right? Obviously, the the ability for us to have a conversation on this podcast is is obviously the catalyst or the foundation of the business. But what it, what was it like also unfolding? Because you're also getting a marriage with the whole business, right? We're accounting together. We're buying stuff together. We're mm-hmm. we're are, we're getting deep into that. We have to scale this business. Like, you know, do you rem- do you recall what it was like to watch? all of us kind of fall into our roles in the business. And was you, you were ever worried about, oh God, like, you know, with these three personalities, are they going to be fighting over who's in charge of this or that? Like, do you remember all that stuff going through your head? Yeah, that's always a concern. You know, the thing that can derail something good like this is some type of division within the ranks. So if, you know, somebody felt like, oh, I'm putting all the time and energy into this and and you're not putting time and energy into this, or you're getting all the time on the podcast. I'm not getting time on the podcast, or we should go buy buy this crazy thing here and nobody else agrees. If there's that type of division in the group, we wouldn't be here right now. So yeah, I was very concerned about that. But as I saw everybody's personalities kind of meld and mesh together, over time, I was able to relax uh, a lot. And now, of course, I'm completely comfortable about this. But, you know, as I've looked back on this, what I, I understand now is that it's values driven. So we all possess, even though we're very different in many ways, we all possess core values that we share and they're extremely important to each and every one of us. And one of them obviously is integrity. We're all hard workers. We all value, you know, creativity and uh, being passionate about what we do. So we we have all these values that we share. And so that negates any of the small differences that don't really matter. Mm. And I think that's true for any relationship, Mm. whether it's a romantic relationship or something else. As long as your core values are aligned, you can overlook a lot of other things. Yeah. So fortunately, we have been able to grow in a very positive way together. We've been able to really come together as really a kind of a single unit here. And everybody just kind of does what they do best. And in the end of the day, we all have the same goal and the same outcome that we're trying to uh, achieve. You mm-hmm. So, okay, in six years now, uh, we've been together or coming up on six years. Uh, do you have uh, uh, favorite moments of each of us, like that you re- that you recall? Whether that be like a moment of realization that, like, oh, I I really like this guy, or I really like what we're doing together, or you know, really feeling like someone came through. I've, do you recall you know pivotal moments within the six years of of feelings for each other like that? Boy, that's that's tough because there's been a lot of things that have happened over the past six years. Yeah. So I'll just say, like, for example, with Justin, the thing I really appreciated about Justin is his sense of humor, right? Uh, I really align with Justin's sense of humor. And if if people have not figured it out yet, he's a little bit twisted. Uh, (laughs) If you've seen the Magic Spoon commercial or some of the other things. But I appreciate that. That's kind of my sense of humor as well. I like Mm -hmm. little things on the edge, a little dark sometimes. So I really appreciate that. But I could also, you know, I don't think it's necessarily individual situations that made me feel the way I do now, I think it's been a, a cumulative effect. effect. Mm. Over time, I've, I've just seen each of you deal with so many different situ, uh, circumstances and the way you handle it mm. and to see that you've done it in, with integrity. Um, I mean, I see you, Adam, on the phone and I really appreciate your confidence. And the one thing about you is you never let anything get in your way. Uh, whether you can pronounce a word or not, doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you, you do it, it. You barrel through it. And you <laughs> yeah. have, there's no shame. Yeah. You know, that is amazing. I think everybody, if you could just do the same thing that Adam does, your life will be so much better. Totally. And, and your mm. barriers and walls and everything will be broken down. Mm. For me, I've been very much a perfectionist, so I've oftentimes waited for that very 
perfect moment to do things, but that's not when things get done because mm-hmm. there's never a perfect moment. Mm-hmm. It's all about taking some type of action and to be swift with it and just do it. So, I, I mean, I hear you're, you're on the phone with sponsors and things like that, and you're, you're asking tough questions mm-hmm. and you have no problem doing that. And I admire that mm-hmm. for sure. And then, of course, you know, Sal is, uh, I've had a much longer relationship with you. But Sal is this person, he's, he's a very nurturing person. Mm. I see how he, he is with people that are having a hard time, and he's, he's got a, a very open heart. Um, he'll say some crazy things at times, but that's just in fun. But in reality, he's a very soft-hearted person that really knows how to build relationships, and so I've really appreciated that. Yeah. But I think, you know, all of you, I can say – without uh, hesitation that you're all exemplary individuals. I think we all, uh, as as different as we all are too, I feel, or at least I feel this way about each of you individually, that there's, there's something I really connect with each of you. Like there's something about each one of you that I see myself in a little bit. Do you feel that same way too? Like when you look at each one of us, is there you like you did that really well with Justin? Like you made that like yeah. you guys have that major connection. Is there something in each one of us? Yeah, there's that a you, lot I relate to you for sure, Doug. Right? Yeah. Well, I I know for you, Adam, you and you and I, we both share uh, the interest in the business aspect of things, growing a business, scaling a business, and we often have conversations around this. So this is kind of the thing that you and I share a lot is yeah. the, these type of conversations. Uh, and of course, Sal. I mean, I. I really appreciate your interest in health and fitness and the science and everything behind that because I spent years, I read a lot. I mean, I, I've, for a lay person, I know a lot about a lot of things in the health and fitness space. And I really connect with Sal on that is like getting in kind of the nerdy aspects of fitness and health and really understanding uh, the human body and how to optimize it. So th- these are things that I really share with Sal. And, um, you know, that, I guess that's just one thing, but there's right, right. a lot of things. Right, yeah. right. No, I agree. I think that's something that we all have, right? There's something, I see that with all of you guys, yeah. like, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, there, you know, there were, there were as you're talking, there were two uh, moments where uh, that, for me, specifically for me, where I said, oh, this is, uh, this is going to be a good thing. The first, and a lot of people might not know this, we've talked about this on the podcast, but initially when we started, there was another host uh, who started with us. We never aired those episodes, but uh, it was Craig, uh, our friend Craig, and he had the largest social media following out of all of us. He had the most authority. He was a signed athlete, and nobody talked about it, but I think all of us kind of thought, okay, he's going to bring us the initial audience. Mm-hmm. And then we had that that phone call where he said, I'm not going to do this, guys. We can't air these episodes. Yep. I'm going to drop out. He's afraid of losing his sponsorship money. And when we got that, I might have been through text, if I'm not mistaken. We got that text. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, okay, I'm going to need to get on the phone and rally the troops and motivate everybody because I don't want to stop doing this. And we got on a conference call, all of us. And before I could say a word, Adam already had said that right right out the gates. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to keep going anyway. Let's just, Justin's like, I'm on board. And right at that moment, I realized like, oh, this is going to be a good thing. Because that was at that time... It could have been a crushing. It, could, it felt like it could have been a crushing blow. Well, there, yeah. there goes our exposure. Yeah, yeah. that time, at that time, that was the uh, the best thing we had working for us. Totally. And <laughs> the, and, so. the, and the second thing was about a year into the podcast um, when we decided that we were going to sell our programs uh, because you guys had a nutrition survival guide you had created. Uh, Doug and I had created Maps Anabolic. There was no question that we were going to sell the programs, and it was going to be all of ours. It was no, it's mine, it's yours, you get this percent. There wasn't even discussion. Yeah. It was, we're going to do this and, and that. And it was just, that's the way it's going to be. All of us understood and valued each other's value. So there was never, there's never been that question where it's like, but I created this. I spent all the time right. and I'm going to get, all of us were like, Which let's do it. a very this. rare thing. Very rare. And those are the two, those are the two things that stand out to, for me. Like yeah. one, those two things happen and I was like, oh yeah, this is forever. This is a big thing. Do you remember standout moments for you, Justin? 
uh, with Doug, or was no, this just, all you guys? Just in general with the business. I mean, we just, I know we've transitioned from the talking to Doug's story in the business, but we're here now. Yeah, I mean, I, again, that's a that's a big one. Is is you know once we kind of dwindled it down to the three of us and like how that whole dynamic was going to go, we were like kind of thinking about the flow and like how we were going to get traffic and. Um, but honestly, like I had no, I had no reserves about it at all. I just felt like it was so much fun. We were just having so much fun in the beginning and we had so much in common. We had so much to tackle. I felt like there was never a shortage of conversations that were going to happen after that. So I just, uh, it was, it was kind of a strange thing. I just knew it was going to take off. I remember us talking amongst e- each other about like why we weren't bigger than we were. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like always the conversation. Yeah. We, we always and had I that firmly confidence. believe that, you know, <laughs> I really did. Of grandeur, you have to be a little delusional. That's what they say, right? Yeah. You true. have to be a little delusional for sure. I just loved our, yeah. I loved the, the, the group synergy, the, the confidence. Like I, I could feed off of you guys because I, you know, it, it's just when you're around people that excel in things, it just, elevates you everybody in here has elevated me as a, as a human being and uh and, and that's just like it's one of those things it's such a rare combination of different pieces that all kind of came together but um uh that, that's just something i've i've only felt that one or two other times and that was with the best teams i've ever been on that we won championships with right. and this has that same dynamic Right, selflessness. Yeah. Right. Do you yeah. have any moments like that? Don't we? Yeah. So I have this moment that I share. Um, you know, every once in a while, when this question gets asked, like, so I get a question asked, pretty common when I get interviewed, and it's, um, you know, when when did you guys feel like you made it? You know, like mm. when did you like feel like you had arrived or you had made it or the business was, and you know, it's a it's a really uh, special moment for me um, when this happened, and and it, it it speaks to all of our personalities though, at the same time. And that was, uh, I, I, w- I was having a conversation uh, with Cassie. And Cassie, for the listeners that don't know, uh, runs customer service on the, on the back end. And Cassidy, Cassie fields uh, anywhere from 50 to about 100 emails a day. And, uh, you know, people that go through our programs, if you have ever questions or you don't know what you're doing or you're struggling with something or you can't do an exercise, you can always email in and we have support. And, uh, you know, we have software so we can see uh, how many programs somebody owned and when they bought them and all these details, right? So... She's having a conversation with with a customer that owns three of our programs. She's currently going through one of them. I don't remember which one it was. And, uh, you know, Cassie's responding to her and she references uh, something that you or I said in the podcast. I can't remember if it was me. I, I think when I tell the story, I tell it as me, but it might have been you. Like, oh, when did, you know, Sal said when you do this or this or that, like that, um, that you should do this, you mm-hmm. know? And the response that the lady gave was, who the hell is Sal? You know, or who the hell was Adam? I don't remember which one it was. And that was a really special moment for me. And the reason why that was such a special moment and and how it speaks to our personalities was the one of the things that where I knew we had something very special, and it, it back to your story with Craig, is the the four of us never wanted it to be about us. Mm-hmm. It, it, we didn't even want it at all. It was it was the desire always was, can we build something so valuable? That it, it could, it'll live on well beyond us and be greater than any of us. And and none of us wanted the limelight. None of us wanted to be Insta famous or be the celebrity on YouTube. Like nobody wanted that. And when that moment happened, that we had somebody who had you know spent a few hundred dollars on our business and been with us for over a year and didn't know who the hell Sal or Adam was. That was a very special moment for me. That that to me it signified mm-hmm. that we were we we're in the direction or we we're on our path of what I thought was so important if we were going to build something as grand as we all believe from day one it would be, which is, it is. It's bigger than who we are. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than either, any of us individually. And I think that only works when the owners or the creators want that, you know? And that doesn't happen a lot. And it doesn't seem to have, it's, it seems to be very rare today more so than ever. I feel like, you know, the the formula today that's taught to this generation coming up is, you know, you know, build yourself as insta famous and, you know, it needs to be all about you. And even all these little things that you go, these like, you know, influencer groups and shit, they, you know, they encourage you to be on your stories all the time and Mm -hmm. constantly, and it's all about you. It's all about you. And, you know, one thing that I I loved about all you guys is it was never about any of us, you Mm -hmm. know, the stories you're all sharing about the programs and, Mm -hmm. you know, and then with Craig and, you know, nobody wanting to be the man, you know, nobody, I mean, shit, we didn't even have a, real formal minutes, CMO, CFO type of 
conversation to like three years so, into the business. Yeah, so we were told, we which had by to, the way, yeah. any you know business you know professor would tell you that's like. You know, it's the death sentence. Right. They yeah. would say to you right away, like, you want to fail, you know, don't be yeah. organized, don't, you know, and yeah. we didn't. We did, but it, it's not because we were disorganized. It was that nobody cared to insert themselves into, assert themselves into a role and say, I'm this position, you're that mm -hmm. position. We all just, we wanted to be better. We wanted it to be better than, bigger and better than us. And, yeah, that moment was a big deal for me. It was a really big deal. And I remember going like, this is cool. This is cool that somebody has invested in something that we have created and put out there into the ether. And has no idea who we are. has no idea who we That's are. That's so awesome. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to, one last thing I want to say, Doug, is uh, <clears throat> that you, you, you're, you're silent, uh, but very supportive, strong leadership on the back end is really phenomenal. And it's, mm -hmm. it's so effective. Okay, it's because what you're dealing with, and you know, you know this uh, better than anybody. You're dealing with three headstrong, uh, kind of, you know, whatever word you want to use, alpha, you, you know, bulls. And had you gotten in front of us and told us what to do, what not to do, and how to do it, and it would have never worked. You did it so effectively, so subtly that I can only recognize it in hindsight. I can only look back. <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. I look back and go. Doug was very quietly guiding and shifting the show and allowing us to develop our voices and what we say and how we do it in a way that was so effective that none of us even noticed. No, he does. He has a Zen master. No, I have to add to that, right? He has this very, uh, the, a very subtle way. And it, again, he's like it, a sensei. Well, yeah, it, yeah. Just, it speaks to his brilliance of knowing that. Like, you, here's something that, like, you, you uh, and I have this too. Sal's worse than me, though, I believe. Like, <laughs> uh, we both have these personalities where it, even if it's what's best for us or what we should do, if you tell us that you're going to, you have to do yeah. it, we just, it's in our, our blood to go against the grain. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like Doug knew that early and and never did that to either you or I never mm -hmm. or Justin either none of us like he never said stop doing that or that's bad or never took a hard stance he would do these subtle like you know I think we mm. should you know pull back or, a little or, bit or, or read or, a review yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we should pull back Probably a little bit on the f-bombs yeah or maybe yeah. maybe stop with the masturbation joke so much yeah, or, yeah. you know I think we should lighten up on the politics you know like yeah. so he would give these real so, and of course, the natural response was, "No, I think it's good, Doug. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that's why I think we should do it." And yeah. we would, we would, and we'd push back, and he would allow the pushback, and then he'd circle back again, and kind of drop it again, circle back again, and then eventually, I feel like we would go, we would conform, and you know, so I, I feel like he's been masterfully steering this ship uh, this whole time, but doing it in a, in a very silent oh, and subtle way, totally like mm -hmm. like like uh, sensei. A hundred percent like a sensei. Yeah. So um, I think part of it is I hate being told what to do too. <laughs> so you relate. Yeah. So I relate. And I know if you tell me to do something or tell me I'm doing something wrong, I, I'm not going to respond well to that. Mm -hmm. I may end up conforming at some point, but I'm going to be resentful. Right. So ultimately, I, I always think the best way to get people to change is to make it their idea. And so if you can just provide enough fodder to create that feeling that, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be doing so many dick jokes, yeah. <laughs> uh, then that's the way I like it because then that's when real change will take place. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing when, mm -hmm. when you know that the other person or persons uh, – are, they have a, a deep desire to to be better and to grow as individuals because you're right. If you if you surround yourself around other people, and this just goes for anyone listening, not, not even just talking about business and just friendships and relationships. If you surround yourself with other people that have a deep desire to be better, um, eventually they'll get to that. And 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 pushing them in that direction is is not is not the way you need to go with that person. That person is already seeking growth, seeking to be a better person. Uh, eventually they'll get around to it. And, uh, you know, whether you put a lot of thought into knowing that or thinking about that. It, it's it, wisdom. Yeah, it definitely. It, yes, it, it is. It, it definitely, He's our wise one. That's yeah. definitely the right word. Wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has easily been my favorite interview. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Easily my favorite interview that we've done. Yeah, a lot of stuff I didn't know. I that, know. I'm glad we did it. Cool we were, insight. We, yeah, it was kind of a off the cuff idea, but I tell you what, I'm I, I learned stuff today, so that was cool. Yeah, man. Thanks for doing it, Doug. Well, Being thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Super producer Doug. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Look, you can find Mind Pump on YouTube. Uh, so find us 
Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on social media. We're on Instagram and Parlor. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Doug at Mind Pump Doug. And if you follow Doug on Instagram, you can see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, what a producer needs to do to create and produce the number one fitness podcast in the world. Boom. Nice. Your skin. Makeup. Yeah. Why are you wearing makeup? Oh, oh look at that <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my so, God. I got a new character I'm developing here, so we'll see how he does. The samurai devil? Y- yeah, it's something. It, it, we call him Satonio. That's uh, <laughs> that's his name, and uh, you guys will see it you know, down the road. 